Our next presentation is Audits, a Field Operator's Perspective, presented by Justin Dingle of the California Air Resources Board. For my presentation today, I'll be talking about preparation for audits and how a site operator can maintain proper site practices by paying attention to small and broader details in goals of avoiding making mistakes and avoiding bad habits. Hence, the title of this presentation is Audits, a Field Operator's Perspective, Preparation and Meeting the Expectation. Here is the overview of the presentation and the topics that we will discuss. I will start off with the purpose and objectives of this presentation, the type of audits you may encounter, actions that we can prepare ourselves for audits, and I'll conclude with a recap and take any questions at the end. So our objective is to use this presentation as a guide when preparing for audits and hopefully build up to it. Second, we want to be aware and perform good practices, whether you are reviewing data at a consistent basis or performing routine maintenance at your site. Also, we want to avoid mistakes or at minimum learn from our mistakes and also avoid bad habits. And the last thing I want to point out is that what to do before audits, such as gathering the proper documents and also making sure that your instruments are performing within the criteria range. As site operators, there are a few types of audits that we may encounter. Number one, through the probe, typically auditors will feed a known concentration of pollutant into your sampling system at your inlet. And this is the best way to simulate ambient sampling when you are in the field. Number two, you also have performance audits, such as siting criteria. You ask yourself, does the station meet the minimum requirements? Is your PM monitor, gaseous monitors performing to the criteria limits and also determining the residence time? Today, I'll talk about siting and also gadgets monitors in regards to performance evaluation. There is also the National Performance Audit Program, NPAP, and finally, the Technical System Audits, the TSAs, which is conducted every three years to capture the overall performance of your station. And this includes determining if your station and also your duties as site operators are being met on a regular basis. There are several topics that I'll talk about today. Number one, siting, which includes dealing with obstructions and also sampling residence time of your instrument. Number two, documentation, are your paperwork completed and also present? Number three, data, how do you deal with data and type of approaches that you'll do when you are reviewing data? Equipment in relationship to the data, is your analyzer performing properly using calibration data and other metadata such as, such as diagnostics data? And finally, I have some miscellaneous topics that I will talk about as well, such as site organization, the safety and security of your station, and also the health of your station. And I will start off with siting in my next slide. The key aspects of siting criteria that is important and to be more aware about, they are inlet criteria, obstruction criteria, and also a distance to the roadways. And I'll focus on inlet and obstruction criteria for today. For inlet criteria, if you have plans on rearranging your inlets, changing your sampling system, or finding any other reasons that the position of your inlet will change, there are several questions that you may want to ask yourself. Number one, are the inlets separated properly? For example, are the distance from inlet to inlet far enough? What is your sampling height? How far is your candy cane inlet to the ground? Are your sampling lines clean and debris free? And yeah, you don't want any dirt or PM on your inlet lines it is known to scrub gas pollutants and also reduce your ozone concentration and bias your, your concentration. And I'll talk about residence time later in the next slide, but if you know your specific of your sampling train, you can calculate the overall residence time. I also have a slide on the pros and cons of using different kind, kinds of station manifolds. So how can that impact residence time as well? And I will also discuss the obstructions and the types of factors into the calculation and being able to understand if your sampling inlet is far enough from trees or buildings. And also you have roadways. I won't talk too much about roadways, but the distance from roadways is also important. And when you have implication of NO pollutants, that's um, important to your measurements. Being able to calculate the residence time for an air mass from your inlet to the detector of your analyzer is a fundamental skill for siting criteria. First of all, you need several parameters in order to determine the residence time. So 
what you need to know listed in this Excel sheet is number one, the length of your sampling line, the internal diameter of that sampling line, the length of your candy cane inlet, the internal diameter of that candy cane inlet, the length and the internal diameter of that station manifold, and also the flow rates of your instrument, whether, you're ha whether you have a NOx analyzer and also a ozone analyzer. And essentially you are calculating the total volume of the air mass that can go through your sampling train divided by the total flow of your instrument and, your, and our goal is to get residence time lower than 20 seconds. And 20 seconds is low, low enough and sufficient enough to prevent air mass disparity from the candy cane inlet to your analyzer. So the federal criteria for residence time should be 20 seconds or lower, but for CARB is 10 seconds or lower. And one thing to note about calculation, this represents residence time of air mass from the candy cane inlet to the bulkhead of the inlet of the analyzers, meaning that it doesn't include the internal sampling train of your analyzers. So that's one thing to note about calculating this um, residence time. Your station manifold plays a key role in your residence time calculation, and the type of manifold you'll be using depends on your sampling goals. For example, if your station needs to sample multiple gas species, you may want to use a multi-port manifold shown here to the left, or if you're just using a or focusing on one pollutant such as ozone as a minimum requirement for sampling, you may want to use a smaller manifold or even without a manifold and just use an external filter holder here shown to the right. There are several caveats when using these type of manifolds, especially the ones with multi-ports. And one disadvantage is that leak can leaks can occur around the Teflon fittings. And if there are leaks, um, your residence time will, will change or even your analyzer will be sampling room air that will dilute your sample. And one thing you can do is try to avoid mismatching fittings. For example, don't mismatch Teflon fittings with stainless steel fittings. And that may lead to leaks and also that may lead to breaking your glass manifold as well. The last thing I do want to point out is that overpressurization in your manifold can occur, especially during the night calibration when you're feeding known concentration of pollutants from your, from your station calibrator into your manifold straight to your analyzers. And we want to monitor that. And one way to monitor that there's overpressurization into your manifold is to use a magnahelic gauge that's connected. And you can check how much of the pressure changes when, there is, when you're on your night calibration. But if you don't have a magnet helix to, to check your pressurization, you can try to check your analyzer. And if your analyzer flow or your, its pressure, internal pressure changes when during night calibration, that can be signification of a overpressurization in your glass manifold. And one thing I do want to point out is that if you're not meeting the residence time requirement, you can always use an external pump booster to get your res time to be around 20 seconds and lower, but you have to be aware that pumps can fail and that can change your residence time to go over 20. So just to make sure that you're not increasing your residence time to go over 20. So the main point of this slide is to be aware of leaks and try to understand that the compa uh, compatibilities for fittings and be aware of over pressurization into your manifold. Like different glass manifolds, there are also different kinds of candy cane inlets, mostly due to their different internal diameters, and this can affect your residence time calculations. And one thing I do want to point about candy cane inlets, these can accumulate PM and dust over time, and in turn that can get into your sampling line and can cause concentration issues and also bias your measurement through scrubbing. And one thing we want to do periodically is try to check and clean our inlets, and you can try to do that with compressed air, blowing air out of the out of the inlet and try to remove your debris. Or we can also use Kim wipes to remove the dust or PM. And lastly, the key question that we want to ask ourselves is how often do we actually clean the, the inlets? And we want to check periodically that we do want to clean those. Now we know our inlets will be located, we can move on to obstructions. There are, there are sites that are surrounded by vegetation and trees, and those can grow over time. So it is a good idea to pay attention to obstruction. And there are a couple rules and criteria to follow to make sure your site is in the clear. So there are three rules and criteria. Number one, the drip line rule. Number two, the two to one rule. And number three, the 270 degree rule. 
Here's an example of our Mojave site where we move from one location to a temporary location. And essentially, the Mojave site is surrounded by trees, and we want to figure out and determine if the inlets are clear from obstruction. So number one, the drip line rule states that the probe or inlet should not be within 10 meters of the tree branches. And in our case scenario, it is well over 10 meters, and we are about 26 meters. So the first rule checks out. The two to one rule asks whether the inlet's distance to the trees, and in our case again is 26 meters, is greater than two times the distance or height the trees is above the inlet, which is two times five meters equating to 10 meters. And since 26 meters is greater than 10 meters, we pass this rule and this rule checks out. And you can also determine the two to one rule by determining the angle of the of the, the the probe to the tree using geometric calculations and this is another way to determine that rule and the third rule which is the 270 degree rule is imp implemented if the two to one rule was violated so if our criteria violates the two to one rule we must use the 270 degree rule and we need to use that so the 270 degree rule states that there must be unrestricted flow or airflow of 270 degrees around the inlet probe. For example, in Mojave, if the trees were too high and the trees are too close to the inlet, we must determine if the, the probe is free from obstruction by 270 degrees. So if the third rule fails, this may result in a corrective action notification. And the point to highlight in regards to citing obstruction is to understand that these obstruction may influence and also bias our measurement data. So it's important to know these uh, rules and criteria in determining whether your, your inlets are far enough from obstruction. We have discussed on what goes outside the shelter. Now we'll discuss on what goes inside the shelter. So to build good habits and also avoid bad ones, Organization is key and also important when working at your site. First of all, we want to ask ourselves several questions to help our organization of our sites. Number one, how are logbooks kept and other types of field documentation? Can we easily find these documents and are they accessible? Are these sites well organized and clean? Is safety an issue? Are the walkways clear from clutter? Also, try to be aware of wires and try to prevent them from being on the ground. And if you can't avoid having cords on the ground, try to put warning signs around them so we can see uh, the obstruction. Also, we want to try to avoid electronics being on the ground just in case water gets into the sites. And also, inventory. Do we have any spares on standby? Um, do we have instruments on standby, filter, pumps, and etc.? And how are these spares obtainable? Are they obtainable? Can we easily get them? And there are also other questions we want to ask about organiza organization, and these are just some of the few. In addition to organization, knowing where our documents are stored and what kind of documents are there available to us is also important. And the reason for this is having documents such as logs, QC sheets, manuals, and SOPs is because it gives us the ability to monitor the performance of our analyzers through documentation and also help us validate data and provide us guidance through step-by-step -step based from SOPs. First, the instrument logs are important kind of documentation that where we can list daily actions as operators that occurs into our sites. And also a common practice for CARB operators to provide is to provide milestone events performed on instruments such as calibration dates, maintenance done on the instrument and other events. Another common practice for CARB operators is to monitor the analyzer's diagnostic data and also the meta parameters, such as looking at the internal temperature, how that changed over time, the voltage, and other parameters that we analyze as metadata. And this is important in validating data to provide weight of evidence for validation. And lastly, we have manuals and SOPs are also good to have in hard copy or electronic copies. So SLPs provide us a step-by-step -step procedure when operating analyzers, and also to note that manuals and also SLPs can also be updated once in a while, and that is also important to monitor if they change. Next, I'll talk about dates and why dates are important.
So dates are important and there are a couple of dates that you should note in your schedule or your calendar to be aware about, such as certification dates, uh, for example, here to the left, cylinders, transfer standards, and also flow standards expires. So it's always good to be aware when the expiration date is and when the certification date will be at. And it will be detrimental to data validation if these devices or cylinders are used when they are out of date and this may cause for data invalidation. So that's important. So also knowing when your next calibration date is also important. So you wanna know when your instrument needs to be calibrated in an as is basis or any maintenance that's need to be done for on your analyzer. And this is also advantageous because it tracks the instrument's performance for calibration and allows for proactive maintenance approach to prevent instrument failure. Another reason why you wanna know date is to know when your audit date is. And knowing this date gives you goals of preparation, also gather the proper documents that you'll be needing to be provided to the auditors. And finally, you want also wanna be aware of different date formatting um, that is written on certification forms and also in other documentation. Sometimes there could be confusion about dates when it's formatted differently. And this can result into using expired equipment or cylinders or even miss calibration dates. So you also want to be aware of different formatting of different dates. The next topic I want to talk about in regards to documentation is archiving and also data retention. First, for my section at CARV, we have established a centralized system uh, where we can find data packets for first level, second level, and third level review, which we can get more easily. And we have a share drive that we establish where we can upload and download data packets such as QC sheets, Cal sheets, and other paperwork. And the advant advantage of having a share drive is that we can get our documents more easily when we are at site or if we're in the office. And also we can, it allows us to go paperless as well. Second, CARB operators have an advantage of receiving raw data files, instrument error files, and also night calibration files on a daily basis. And these information is important if the operator want to cross-reference and verify data more easily. And finally, for hard copies of documents, as mentioned in the previous slide, these documents are submitted information to support data validation and making sure that these forms are completed through different levels of review. So for these hard copies right now, we have year by year or monthly by monthly data packets. And in the future, we hopefully move into a more paperless um, goals as well. So here are examples on the type of documentation that we do use in CARB. And for our final rule of thumb about documentation, make sure that writing is legible and easily readable. Make sure that the forms are clear and completed, and also they are easily accessible to you and your team. So this is just an example of the types of paperwork that we use uh, to be successful when we do our operation at our sites. For the next topic is equipment use and setups. I know most of us are not calibrators, but I'm gonna use some of the principles of being a calibrator and also apply that to our operating duties as site operators. And I'll use several examples. One example is when we, rece we receive new equipment or any kind of a certified equipment. For us, portable calibrators are often received every six months when it is turned into the standards lab and returned back. And one thing we do wanna monitor is that whether the parameters have changed or not, and we wanna cross-reference that as well. And also we wanna document if we ourselves make any changes to the parameters, and that's one way we could trace back as well. The other thing I wanna point out is operator consistency on setups, um, making sure that one calibrator is using similar setup as another calibrator. For example, the setup as seen here in the picture, are we using the same methods, the procedure? And that is important to keep things consistent and uniform so we can get, I guess, similar results, try to get similar results by using similar information and instructions. Now as calibrators, we have the opportunity to analyze the performance, the precision, and also the accuracy of the particular analyzer that we are calibrating. And we ask ourselves if the concentration currently drifted from the last verification, do I need to perform any maintenance? Do I need to update the slope or the offset of the analyzers? And 
how does the concentration values compare to the night calibration or do I need to perform a final after any maintenance or any changes has been done? So these are important questions that we want to ask ourselves in regards to understanding the instrument performance um, and also comparing from previous data as well. I believe that most of us, if not all, are data scientists and there are ways that we can track instrument performance using data that is provided for us, such as night calibration to the left, diagnostic and metadata to the middle, and also real-time data. And ultimately, we want to provide support of evidence for defensible data and these three the night cows, the diagnostic data, and also real-time real data can provide that. So for the night calibration, we feed known concentration of a target pollutant to the analyzer and determine the precision and also the accuracy of that instrument and determine the performance. We can also evaluate the values in a day-by-day -day basis and see if there's any drift in the concentration detected. Secondly, like mentioned previously, diagnostic and metadata gives us the op uh, information of operating parameters of the instrument, whether the temperature parameters, the flow, or the other parameters are within the limit range of the acceptable, acceptable criteria values. If you receive data in real time, it's also a good process and practice to check the data um, if they're coming periodically and if the data is not registering online, there's a possibility that on site the computer may be down or there's some kind of power outage. And that's a good sign to go to the site and check it out. Um, for us, CARB in the south section, we receive real time data every hour. And this gives us the opportunity to analyze and evaluate data for each hour and see if the data makes sense. For example, um, if chemistry makes sense, like the one we see here to the right. Typically, when photochemistry happens, ozone do increase over time and during the noon time here in red. And how, that's how does that correlate with the, the nitric oxide values um, here, in, here in green? So typically, when we see ozone goes up, uh, NOx value goes down. So we want to make sure that these data make sense in the real time sense, the, the diagnostic sense, and also during night calibration sense. Another way you can approach data and see if the data makes sense is also through buddy site comparison. You can have a qualitative and also quantitative approach to it. For example, one of the best tools we have is to utilize AQMIS2 database where we can perform time series comparison from one site to another as seen here to the left. Here I compared ozone concentration with Mojave with Lancaster and also Barstow sites. And the advantage of using these buddy site and time series comparison is that you can track events and also see spikes when it happens. And you can see here to the middle where I compared Edison and also Arvin sites. So you can see when and where the, the, the spike occurs. So that, that's a good way to do a qualitative approach. For a quantitative approach, you can do buddy site correlation. Um, where you can put a number into the comparison. For example, here I plotted um, Edison ozone hourly concentration with Arvins. And what you can get is, is the slope, the intercept, and the R squared correlation factor and see how the comparison is like. And here, an example where the co correlation is strong for these two um, ozone species at two different spot, uh, locations. With that said, data should tell a story whether you are dealing with a metadata or also with concentration data. Here's a time series of ozone, the internal box temperature of the analyzer, and also the indoor temperature of the Arvin site. When I was doing a, a data analysis in the office, I did notice two things. I did get an email that I got a um, error that the internal temperature of the shelter decreased to the um, below the acceptable criteria value for indoor temperature. And also I see in my analysis that there is a big dip in temperature shown here in um, light blue and also in green. And one thing I did ask myself is what what is going on? So this just happened during the new years. So what caused that is that during that time, um, our trailer got broke into and cold air was coming through the, the trailer. The good thing is that nothing was stolen, but nonetheless, the main point is that the, the data can tell an action or when an event happens. So when an event does happen, 
um, like this. We do have to note it. Um, and there are specifics on what to do, such as call um, your local police department and also um, doing the, the right actions, just, such as taking the instrument back to a safe location and making plans ahead. So when an event or action does take place, such as when your trailer gets broken into, it, sh it should also be properly flag encoded as seen here. Um, and your flagging encoding should tell a story. So the idea of flagging encoding is to provide information on what happened at a particular site and whether um, ambient data stopped collecting or not, or calibration has happened or uh, maintenance or any power outage, you have to flag it properly. And the flagging encoding has to tell a story overall. In addition, having access to this kind of history or this kind of information in terms of flagging gives me the uh, ability to trace back in time to see how other operators flag and code their data. For example, I have, for example, if an event happened, I can trace back and see what other operators have done and I can replicate their their web coding and in a way try to tell a story that way. To end about data, here are some final thoughts on data and some questions that we want to ask ourselves when we are dealing with these types of data. How complete is the data process? Is the application of null codes proper? The null qualifiers and flags, are they properly coded to tell a story? Are the QC calibration sheets, are they complete? Um, how ready is it for submittal to AQS? And also as site operators, do we review data daily? How does the continuous data look? Do we look at the minute data as well? Are there any minute gaps or even hourly gaps? Uh, do we want to fill that out? Uh, for data validation process, do we is your first level, second level, and third level um, data validation complete? And also, how complete are your data packets? And these are just a few of the questions that we do want to ask. Um, but ultimately, the main point is, is our data validation and our documents complete? So finally, in conclusion, the topics I talk about is site team criteria and site team criteria allow us to make sure that we are well organized. We are following the sampling rules and sampling air pollutants properly. Secondly, for documentation, this also allows for organization, um, allows for performance checks of our instruments and also data validation support. And for data management and analysis allows us for validation and overall story of the events that occur at our sites. So these are the main points and the key highlights I do want to point out. And that is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I would gladly to answer them. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Justin, for the presentation. Uh, we have a question here. How do you perform leak checks on your sampling train? What criteria do you use? How frequently? Yeah, so for my, <clears throat> my Armin site, I only have a external filter. So every time I, a filter holder, every time I do change that filter, I do have to check that, check the leak, uh, if there's any leak. But um, yeah, I do it often for my Armin site. So when I, every time I change my filter, and that's once a week. Grace, you're muted at the moment. Sorry, thank you. Any other questions? Please feel free to type it into the chat, the Q&A chat.
Thanks, Harnick. Um, Justin, could you put your email in the chat? Okay. Um, looks like if people don't really have any questions right now, but if you do have a question for Justin, you can um, feel free to email him at a later time. another comment. Thanks, Hamza. We can leave it up for another minute or so. Um, otherwise, um, Don, yes, this presentation will be available to rewatch. Um, we're aiming to have all the videos available um, in a few weeks after the training. And we'll, we'll send that to everyone, a link to that to everyone. Um, Hansa asks, how often do you clean your sample train lines? So I don't really clean them. Um, I replace them um, once a year, um, probably what right after ozone season. Um, those lines are preconditioned to ozone. Um, yeah. But for candy canes, uh, when it gets dusty and dirty, um, uh, that's when I start cleaning them. Well, uh, we're running out of time here um, in our session, so feel free to reach out to Justin if you have any questions for him. Um, otherwise, we will see you all in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin.